do have a book. We'll be on chapter 2, page 19. <clears throat> and I sort of um, alluded to this chapter already uh, in one of our first ones, but it's always a good one to remember. <clears throat> and it's based on the, the, the title, All Things, is based on the scriptures in Romans 8. As I said, we alluded to this, but I want to just bring out a few more things. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <clears throat> and, um, you know... <clears throat> What it's doing is it's giving us a category that will be shared at the very end of this book that is this um, reality in the heart of God <clears throat> that was apparently in his heart before the foundation of the world <clears throat> was that he would make a creation, but then there would be a new creation. And that new creation would be in his son. And we would, in that new creation, we would be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, we wouldn't be um, selfish and always putting ourselves first, you know. Um, Paul says it well in Philippians 2. Think not upon your own things, but the things of others. And so that means, yeah, it's okay to think on your thing but not strictly and always, only your things. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we see that around here, what Deb was talking about, just different people um, pitching in, doing different things and helping to improve uh, the place. And yet it's more, it's more than people trying to improve the place. It is people that are releasing Christ, that are putting this, something in them, and we know that something is Jesus, something in them wants to put others ahead of themselves or, or whatever. And to me, that spirit is the highest thing that we could do. I mean, you know, we could do, a person could do some great thing, you know, for example, he could be the pastor of the church or whatever, <clears throat> and not do it in that spirit, do it to promote himself or to make everybody else think that he's something or whatever, and totally defile the spirit of Christ. And yet, some people look at that and go, oh, you know, that's a great person. I look at, I look at little things. You know, the Lord said, if you're faithful in little things, then you'll be faithful in much. And I look at little things, and I am deeply impressed by the life of the Lord and people that um, pour out in those ways, in that self-giving way. And that's really, this, these verses here are alluding to that, and that is that... When your determination is lined up with the purpose of God, which is to be conformed to the image of Christ, then all things work together toward that end. All things. It's an amazing thing because, see, you know, you can't, you can't always say, well, anything the devil does necessarily works toward that end unless that's your purpose. And then it definitely, God can use the devil. And we've seen examples where <clears throat> the devil attacks somebody, and they're, um, and it just basically destroyed their faith and their you know walk with the Lord or whatever, and and just you know just destroyed them. You say, well, how did that work for good? Well, that didn't because their purpose wasn't to be conformed to the image of Christ. It was to not ever be attacked or when attacked god deliver me or whatever else but god <clears throat> you i mean you know the greatest example that i can think of is the cross itself you know the motivations of those people that hung jesus on that cross wasn't right 
Did you know that? It says that. I mean, uh, Peter uh, said that in the book of Acts. And he said, you by wicked hands, God by the determinate counsel of God has offered his son, but you murdered his son. Okay. So, <clears throat> so uh, or, or, you know, an, another high example to me is, is Joseph and his brothers, you know, throwing him in the pit, then selling him to basically Ishmael. Uh, and they take him down into Egypt, and he's sold for a slave, and then he ends up, I mean, you know, you'd think he'd get better, it got worse, and he ends up in, in a dungeon, and uh, <clears throat> is there for a long time. But then a situation works out where God gives him a vision of something that they, that clearly Pharaoh uh, knew that only God could have shown him that. So, so it's not just a good man or a, you know, a Jew and we know Jews are good or something like that. It was uh, uh, what is his name? Zaphnath Panea. That's the name. Instead of calling him Joseph, Pharaoh called him Zaphnath Panea. The man to whom God reveals himself. Yeah. <clears throat> And so Joseph being truly that, not in title, just in being, not looking for the title, he gets raised up and becomes second under Pharaoh. And then a famine comes and his, his brothers come. And is, is, there, is there another one of me? Is that, <laughs> God, let him out of that closet now! <laughs> I'm just glad to know he's in there preaching the cross. <laughs> Sorry. And so his brothers are brought before him, and Joseph, instead of treating them bad, breaks down and starts crying and reveals himself to him, and he says these words. You meant this for bad, but God meant it for good. Can, can, can it be possible that, that in the world there can be people who mean stuff bad to you, and yet God means it, he, God allows it and will use it for good? And the answer is, well, absolutely. But it's especially true for those who want to be conformed to the image of his son. Then all things work together for good, and the good is to be conformed to the image of his son. The goal is not, it doesn't say all things, <clears throat> all things work together, all things are good. It doesn't say that. It says it all works together for good. It doesn't say all things are good, you know. Someone can be driving down the road, they leave the church, and you know, let's say that they have, we have a wonderful, service and we just bathe in the presence of the Lord and one of the one of us goes out and gets in the car and drives down the road and two or three blocks down the road has this big wreck or not a big wreck but a wreck you know and it messes up their car and they're going Lord why would you do this you know and <clears throat> all this kind of stuff and maybe never never know that had you gone two blocks more Somebody, you know, somebody might have stepped out in front of you and you run over them or somebody might have hit you and killed you or something like that. And never, you'd never know that because it didn't happen because this wreck stopped all of that. It, it ended the whole chain. And you, and you sit there and blame the Lord for the whole thing. But if you believe that it all works to, for the good of being conformed to the image of Christ, then you say, Lord, use this. And, and it may be years before you look down the, the lane and see exactly what he was doing in your life and why because a lot of times we're in situations that are not good but it's working together with all the other things to conform you to the image of christ and that one thing is not good and that one thing does not conform you to the image of christ but that working together with all other things will help you to be conformed to the image of Christ. <clears throat> All right, so it brings a whole different kind of faith. 
mean, it's a different kind of faith than just believing God to take care of you. It's, it's a heart that lines up more with the Lord than trying to get the Lord to line up with you. In other words, you know, here's, here's, here's me talking, you know, praying to God. Lord, take care of me. You know, don't let bad stuff happen. If it happens, you know, remove it quickly. I'm the center of the universe. I know that I'm the only one that you see. It's all about me. You, whatever you got, use it right here. You know. Or it's, Lord, I'm in this situation, and yet my heart's desire is your heart's desire. That's what I want. I want you satisfied. And if this can add it to this thing here and this thing there and all that, bring me to a place of conformity to your son, then may you get Jesus out of me and not just protect my flesh. You know, and to me, I give those contrasts <clears throat> not so that we measure people or things, but that so we 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 see that there's a greater thing to live for than ourselves, and to have God live for us, but to find out what he, what's important to Him, you know, what's in His heart, to get our focus. Uh, and in one sense, you could even say that what I'm trying to say is not to not have your focus on yourself, but I'm saying let's get our focus on the Lord, which results in what? <laughs> not having our focus on ourselves. All right. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a turning. It's a realizing, you know, before everything was, God was. And when he started it, there was something in his heart. And we don't even know what it is. All we know is, you know, we, we assume it's this. Oh, there was something in God's heart from the very beginning. And that was to turn the devil loose on us so that we would uh, run to Jesus and get saved. And then he could, you know, we'd all be really thankful. You know, really? Is that, I mean, that sounds sort of a cheesy deal to me. I mean, it does. It's, it doesn't, something doesn't sound right with God saying, well, I, I got a plan. I'm going to make an earth and I'm going to make people and then I'm going to turn the devil loose in a garden and then he's going to mess them up and then Jesus will die and then everybody come crawling to me on their knees and go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Believe it or not, Ephesians, the first three chapters and a whole lot of other books of the Bible, says that before the foundation of the world that we were predestinated. In other words, what was, you know, like a train station, and bad example right now, but let's call it a subway then. A subway station, it pulls up, <clears throat> and God says, I made this subway station and this train, and if you get on it, you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what I want. <clears throat> Getting on it may mean that you first get saved. That's the first stop. And then you, you learn about his goodness or you, you know, operate in the Holy Spirit and gifts of the Spirit and whatever and all that. But the end goal is that you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's not just all the things that we're experiencing at all the stops along the way. You've been predestinated. He didn't say you've been predestinated to, um, <clears throat> to function in the gift of healing. No, well, it's a gift, you know. <clears throat> it's not a predestination. But if you stay on the, on the tram there, the train, the subway, you will be, you'll end up with your emphasis the thing that was in his heart from the beginning and not just the things that benefited you in the early stages of the stops that you made along the way. So <clears throat> really all that Paul is calling for here is that we, um, we find the Lord, we find the Father, we find, and you know, the scriptures speak a lot of that. I mean, you know, Ephesians 1 there, when it begins, it says, blessed be 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, who has, and, and it just begins to describe all of this stuff, and you go, oh my God, you know, uh, the, uh, a little phrase I used to use is the, uh, the, uh, the Father sought it, Jesus bought it, and the Holy Spirit wrought it. And it is that, and what that says is this actually seems to have been uh, birthed in the heart of the Father. Now, they're one. We know it's one God, Father, Son, so, you know. But the way that it's worded a lot is that it was birthed in the heart of the Father, and the Son says, whatever's in your heart, even if it means dying, you know. And it's not, he's not, in that sense, it's before the foundation of the world. So we don't even exist yet. So he's not going, oh, those poor people. Those poor sinners, we're, we're not there yet. We hadn't, the devil hadn't even showed up yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is before the foundation of the world, before there's a garden, okay? Jesus didn't, he wasn't looking around at anything else. He says, I will do this for you, Father. Not my will, but thine be done. You know, this is for you. This is, and so then, so, so he, he's walking down the earth, uh, in the earth and he's doing all this stuff and he you know, ministers to somebody, he heals somebody and, and they go, oh look, he's, he does miracles. And, he's, and uh, Jesus said, I didn't do it. It's the Father in me that did the work. He won't glorify himself. He gives the Father all the glory. You talk about not being self-focused. you know. And then Jesus leaves and he sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes and Jesus said, by the way, when this guy gets here, he's not going to speak of himself. He's going to speak of me and he's going to declare. So you see that selfless giving constantly, that, that way that they are. And then they say, okay, you know, so, so the, Jesus is glorifying the Father, but then the Father says, I want everyone conformed to my son, not me. I mean, it's just this constant way that they deal. They're all, it's God. It's who God is. And uh, <clears throat> so he's trying to bring us into that kind of a spirit. He's not trying to make us gods. He's trying to make us selfless. And he does that by forming Christ in us. He doesn't do that by making us gods. <laughs> We're not gods. Just look around a little bit. You'll figure it out. You know? but, but Jesus is God, and he puts him in us. And then he begins to conform our, he says, let this mind be in you. And he begins to describe a selfless mind that came and did totally, did this. Not, even in those scriptures in Philippians 2, doesn't mention salvation, doesn't mention any benefit to us. It's all just a selfless way that God is. Just totally so that way. And all of a sudden, you start realizing, you know, uh, through Jesus, we enter in to eternity, meaning not, not, not going, you know, having a beginning, you know. We say, well, you know, I had a beginning, and then I got saved, and now I'm going to live forever, you know. I had a beginning when I was birthed, and then I got saved. And now I'm going to live forever. Well, people who had their birth and didn't get saved are going to live forever. It just depends on where they get to spend it. I mean, am I right or not? But that's not, that's not eternal life. Eternal life is life without beginning and without end. Eternal life has no beginning and no end. That's not you and me. That's Christ. And that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it's not that we have no beginning or no end, or we have a beginning and no end, now we're going to live forever with God. That's not his heart. That's not, see, that's not the essence of God. That would be God saying, oh, I think I just want, I think I want this some random thing, but he's not random at all. He says, I want you to conform to my image. 
Oh my God, that's a whole different ball game, isn't it? You get, you have to have a salvation, but that the salvation is like the beginning; it's not the end. Does that make sense? You know, you go, "What? Well, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. What now? Well, I don't know. You know, I guess I just do the best I can. Oh, really? You know, I don't think that's going to please God. You know, because He's seen your best. You know. <laughs> It's not about us. It is about his son. And we're supposed to be happy with that. We're supposed to glorify the son the way that the Godhead does it among one another. It's supposed to, and God said, what, what is it that, and uh, boy, am I off from our teaching right now. I mean, I'm not, but it's, um, I think it's in, well, let me just look here real quick. God, God intentionally made Jesus the door that we would enter into this. We would be conformed to the image of his son. God intentionally wanted to make Jesus everything because in his heart, that's what he does. And if it's the Holy Spirit or whatever, whatever he, that's, he's... He's not self-focused. Okay, so listen to, listen to this. <clears throat> Excuse me one moment. Speaking of Jesus here, it says, who is the image of the invisible God? Oh, my God. That's why he could make Jesus that, because he's the door into the, the image of the invisible God. If you get him, you got the whole ball of wax. Yeah, this is Colossians uh, 1, 15, but we're going to read several here. The firstborn of all creation, but it's called, it's, it's this new creation. For by him, now, now just I want you to see how much honor the Father is giving the Son and telling us, look, you need to recognize and start functioning by this same spirit towards him and conform to his image. Okay, so for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, but now here we go. And he is before all things. He is before that. He's telling us he's supposed to be before all things. He's supposed to be before your, re your recreation. He's supposed to be before your hobbies. He's supposed to be before your uh, most loved possessions. He's supposed to be before, he is before all things. And by him, all things hold together, consist. Okay, meaning they fly apart if he's not the center, uh, the, not the circumference, but the center of it. And it brings everything to him. But then there's more. And he just keeps adding higher and deeper. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the church, who, uh, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Here it comes. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Oh, my God. All right. Well, we're not going to we're not going to even know how to give Jesus that kind of honor unless we conform to his spirit. And you say, well, if we're conformed to his spirit, then aren't we glorifying ourselves? No, because once Jesus comes in you, once Jesus, not just in salvation, but once you begin to be conformed to the image of Christ, then all of your prayers. And, you know, I've said this before, but I went through one time in the New Testament, particularly in the epistles you know, once we're supposed to be saved and everything, the Gospels, we hadn't got in yet. So I went through the epistles, and all of the prayers are, are saying, our Father. That means that the Son is in us. And even though Jesus gets all the preeminence, he gets the preeminence in us is as far as what we're conforming to. And once we're conforming to him, he's going to say, Father. Abba, Father. God has sent forth 
because you are sons, meaning because you're saved and in the family, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son, not the Holy Spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. Okay? So once you get the spirit of his son, once you start conforming to the image of the son, he doesn't turn around and go, well, glory to me. You understand what I'm saying? You're the body of Christ, and now the glory out of you is going to the Father. You know, there it is again, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father. Well, I thought we're supposed to be glorifying Jesus. We are. We're glorifying him by conforming to him and letting him do what he likes to do best, glorify someone else. You, you see that? And it's a total selfless relationship, totally. Well, how are we ever going to come to such a high thing? I mean, you know, we're lucky to be saved. How am I ever going to come to that? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you don't come to it. You decrease and he increases. You, and, and you begin to let all things. You see, we, we read that. We go, well, okay, all things work together for good. So oh, that's good because it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring me to the image of Christ. You, what you don't realize is when it says all things work together for good, it means all things are working to, you know, all things are working together for good to conform you to the image of Christ. It means at the same time, all things are working together to decrease you. He must increase and I must decrease. See? So all things are working, and we read it, we go, yeah, glory. <laughs> All things work together for good, yeah, you know, and we get all, you know, we get everybody riled up and everything, and if somebody told the truth, they'd stand up and say, you know, you do realize that that means that everything is going to be trying to take us out of the picture so that there can be more Jesus, you know, it means all things are going to be working for our decrease. You know, Shay and I were talking about it, about the he had mentioned in his sermon when he shared a couple of weeks ago about the, you know, that then we'll be like, we'll leave the 90 and 9 and we'll go find that one. And, you know, in Israel, they had an agricultural society because they had to raise sheep because of the altar, because there was so much uh, sin and sweet savor offerings and burn offerings. I mean, there was a lamb killed every morning and every night during their whole existence, okay? And that was just one thing. Then all these people came in and they offered lambs and this and that and then there was this situation and that. Man, you had to have a lot of, of lambs. A lot. I mean, just on Solomon's dedication of the temple, I forget, but what was it? It was, no, it was like 200,000 sheep. You know, lambs. You know, and so we go, oh, Jesus, you know, Jesus wants us to go leave the 90 and 9 and bring that one back and everything. Yeah, bring them back to the altar so that they can eventually have Christ formed in them and lay down their lives, you know. Um, and uh, 1 John 3, 16, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for, no, the brethren, not God, you know. And so it's like Jesus goes, oh, look, here's a wayward you know, I mean, when it, well, when it says all we like sheep have gone astray, folks, I got news for you. You search it out. This is in, in uh, Isaiah 53. It means that we would not go to the altar. We don't go to the temple to go to the altar. We go to the temple to get blessed. And so in Isaiah 53, it says all we like sheep have gone astray. So he became the lamb. And he took that upon himself. And he bore our iniquities. And he carried our diseases. And he was, you know, the, was smitten for our peace and all the things that it says. The going astray, we think going astray is somebody was really serving God and then they, now they're going to bars. Not really, not really. The deal is, is that they have left the true purpose. And that is, I must decrease. And Christ must increase. And I go to that altar so that, so that there'll be more of him and less of me. And it becomes, a, it becomes the desire of your heart. Only God can put that in your heart. You know what I mean? Now, I can't teach that into you, and nobody can. And, and it, it's not a popular teaching anyway. 
you know, who, who wants to decrease in Christianity? Everybody wants to get better and more and, you know, I want to be stronger. God's trying to kill you. <laughs> well, you know what I'm happy. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He's trying to bring us to the reality of the cross in a manner that was, then he goes and says, but not I, Christ lives within me. So, you know, I've had people say, I've quoted Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. And all you talk about is being crucified and dead. And, you know, you're just a, you know, what kind of preacher are you? My God, you just preach dead. And I said, I, I quote the rest of that scripture. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ lives within me. The goal is Christ in me and in you. The goal isn't death. But guess how it's going to happen? How does that happen? Because we lay down our lives for one another. Because that spirit is at work in us. And it starts with Jesus, but like that scripture says there in 1 John 3, 16, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, that's not an easy thing to do. It's not, unless it's Christ. And he will do it. Because he is it. See, he's, his being is that way. That when you when we say Jesus, you know, people say, oh, I love Jesus. Well, do we really know the Jesus that we're supposed to love? You know, I love Jesus. Well, what, do you, what is it about Jesus that you love? Well, I love that he takes care of everything I ever need. And, and he saved my soul from hell. And he, he, you know, protects me, you know, when I'm driving somewhere. And he, I, I, you know, I've had to stop people and go, do you realize everything that you love about Jesus is that he does stuff for you? I mean, everything that you've just mentioned, you know, and they go, you spoil everything. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't want to mention that we need to be conformed to Christ. You know, I wouldn't want, you know, I wouldn't want to spoil your party that the end goal of this is that, you know, not I, but Christ. Can we all go, praise God? But, you know, it's like, you know. Well, I can't get past this I'm crucified thing, you know. Well, good, because you won't get past the cross. <laughs> You're not going to make it past there. It's going to be Christ in you, the hope of glory. Anyway, I've talked too much. I'm sure y'all can't handle much more of me. Let's have a, a word of prayer. Father, we just love you so much. And we know that we love you because it is the life of Christ within us. And we need you, and we need the work of the Holy Spirit the faithful one, the faithful one that lifts up Christ, the faithful one that will, as it were, bring us from Haran to the tent of Isaac on camels and whatever, however rough that road is, we will end up one with Jesus. That's your heart, that's your way, that's your spirit, that's your eternal plan. That's the eternal plan that was there from the beginning and we just want to acknowledge that now, Father. We don't know the depth of that. We don't know the fullness of that. But we want to acknowledge that we believe that there was something in your heart greater than just saving us from hell and that you were wanting us to desire that. You were wanting us to be with you. And so, Father, I, I, re I admit my total lack as a minister and as a shepherd of being able to impart or to even properly communicate these precious things of your heart. But I ask you to be gracious unto us and allow the Holy Spirit to do that to each and every one of us. We so thank you that we can even present that request before you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, we're dismissed.